Welcome to Startup Fair Fireside Chat. Uh, my name is Lukas Karaitis. Uh, next to me online, next to my web camera, you can see Jamie Sutton, uh, who is a general manager of North America's Omniscient. He used to work as a uh, co-founder at Shopify Plus. He used to be a technology partnership, head of technology partnership there. And today, as most of you know, and I guess there are still some people connecting, uh, we are going to talk about customer success and partnership strategies and how to use it for mutual growth. That's the info you probably already knew. Uh, I hope that today we are going to learn something new about e-commerce. I want to learn from Jamie's experience. I want to understand better what is customer success and how to build partnerships, how to build partnerships that make math one plus one equals three work out. So hi, Jamie. Hi, great to be here. Yeah, it's really nice to have you here. Uh, Jamie is talking to us from USA, which, uh, which state again? Uh, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, so it would be nice to have you here in Lithuania. It would be even cooler to have all the viewers here uh, in live. We can't see them at the moment, but we still have uh, an opportunity, you still have an opportunity to ask questions uh, to I'll, or just write questions in the Facebook feed. Uh, you can write directly to me. I can also redirect the questions to Jamie. So uh, don't be shy, have the questions, uh, use your chance. Uh, it can be a great personal uh, advice, I guess so. So I guess we still have some people who are connecting. So Jamie, I want to start with you uh, with a warm up. I wanted to ask you what are the trends, what are new things in customer su uh, success at the moment uh, in e-commerce, but I guess the whole, the main thing that everyone is talking about is COVID-19 and coronavirus. And on one hand, e-commerce is maybe the one field that is winning kind of from the situation because there are more people online there are more buyers. Uh, how do you see, uh, how did coronavirus affected e-commerce? What are the big changes that are happening at the moment? So I think um, uh, it's, it's multifaceted. Um, it's, it's not just merchants, it's also the industry is having uh, to change as well. But um, on, the, on the retailer front, uh, you know, there's a, a broad push um, to, if you're in brick and mortar, um, to start delivering. If you're not online, to get online, um, to figure out a way to transact, um, to a way to offer, uh, you know, pickup in store or curbside pickup uh, rather than uh, delivery. And this is happening across, you know, hospitality and food. Um, it's also happening with mom and pop stores who um, are, you know, in a, in a large way having to pivot um, into technology that, uh, you know, previously they thought um, really didn't pertain to them. If you've got, you know, a very well uh, designed small boutique, um, a lot of that shopping is experiential. It's being there, it's tangible, it's touching things. Um, so a lot of um, a lot of those retailers are trying to pivot into e-commerce, um, yeah. trying to translate the experience uh, of the brand uh, online um, and trying to stay relevant in the time of COVID. Um, the other thing I just want to, to, to a short question. Do you think that we, the customers, are missing that experience of touching and choosing, seeing the colors live? Do you think that's something? Oh, that's absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, that that's we're we're you know we're three dimensional beings, right? It's very uh, hard to shop for things like clothes online. Like you know, there's all kinds of sizing tools. We all know that nothing is ever sized properly right mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of people like book match and order like two sizes and then return the one that doesn't fit <laughs> yeah. uh, so there's a big difference there in how a you know a retailer um that is brick and mortar has to kind of strategize about how they're going to service new merchants how they're going to present their uh brand online um a lot of them never had photography done if they did it was you know very uh, minimal for things like bro brochures or a, a display ad in a in a local magazine or something like that. So, um, you know, there's a, a, a 
big push now to, you know, how do I get my catalog online? How do I um, advertise? How do I get merchants, uh, excuse me, uh, consumers to actually come to my brand? Um, so there's a lot more competition within kind of an already overcrowded space in some verticals. Um, I think some verticals are doing really, really well. Um, you know, if you uh, sell fitness equipment, um, you're sold out. Um, now the problem is how do I uh, restock? How do I, you know, make sure that I'm actually still receiving inventory and making sure that my supply chain is healthy? Yeah. Um, but if you go on uh, any uh, e-commerce store right now and try to find like simple like kettlebells or dumbbells or jump rope, uh, or a, a bicycle, they're all sold out. Um, so some industries have done really well. Some, uh, in anybody who is selling food is doing really well. Yeah. Uh, deliveries or like, especially like on the, you know, gourmet items, like whether it's cheeses or meats or lobster or seafood, um, uh, have, have done really well. Um, things that happen. Yeah. We have Go some ahead. local companies. Uh, we have some local companies that do delivery and they grew I guess like uh, two or three hundred percent in a in a two month, uh, so yeah. that was really a big time for them. Yeah, um, and and it's been tragic for some, like you know, uh, you know things like jewelry, um, things like shoes uh, are are down. Like I think uh, I saw some stats down over seventy percent. Things like formal wear. Um, I just read uh, there's a really large retailer. Um, multi-brand retailer here in the states uh, called Men's Warehouse, and it is like formal wear um, for weddings, for you know fancy yeah. office meetings. Um, they're down seventy percent. Um, uh, so, so you know things that uh, are are up are inversely um, affected by the things that are are down. Um, that we typically would you know be buying seasonal outfits um, if there's nowhere to go, um, and you're not um, you know dressing up, uh, then you're not going to be buying as many clothes. Um, yeah. so I think the, the challenge for retailers is again, how do they bring their experience, uh, online? Number one, their, their brand, their imagery online. Um, the other is that, you know, how do I support those customers, uh, make returns very easy. Um, and I think that's going to be kind of one of the challenges that some of our technologies are going to be able to help with, including OmniSense. Um, how do I make sure that we stay relevant, we stay um, communicating with our consumers and that we're giving them relevant information? Yeah, but would you agree that uh, most of the e-commerce companies have to make changes that they maybe planned for two or three years in advance and they have to make it in uh, three weeks or three months? So that's, um, that's yeah. a very short period of time and that's a lot of challenges to, to keep it all together, the brand image, the customer support. So. Uh, are we going to see more brands dying out uh, because of this? Or would you say some of them are just taking their time and hopefully they are coming to the online uh, altogether? Um, I think a lot are probably not going to survive in the, the way they have previously. Um, you know, we, we see large retailers closing thousands of stores across the country right now. And um, you know, they're on a, a bit better of a situation because they've got a noticeable brand brand name, you know, things like American Eagle or Gap that already had uh, some e-commerce capabilities and, and maybe don't have the foot traffic can pivot that uh, a lot quicker than, um, you know, smaller uh, outfit, um, a smaller sporting goods store, smaller, smaller dress boutique. Um, so I think this is definitely going to um, make uh, merchants rethink how they're uh, doing business, um, and it's definitely going to accelerate timelines. Um, uh, I think that's even happening in the tech sector, right? We've got you know uh, a lot of tech companies who are basically saying, you know, we're not going to open our offices back up again. Um, yeah. We've got um, you know events moving online that we would normally have in person. Um, if you had told me you know a year ago that you would have thousands of people show up to a virtualized uh, e-commerce industry conference, I would have thought you were joking, um, but here we are. And um, I know uh, like WooCommerce had its uh, European uh, event uh, maybe three or four weeks ago and they were expecting 5,000 attendees to the virtual conference and yeah. like 20,000 people showed up. Um, okay. <laughs> system. So, um, so it's definitely creating a whole lot of, of industry pivots, both um, for the merchants as well as uh, the technology providers themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and you already mentioned customer su support, and that's uh, something that we are uh, used to hear uh, here in Lithuania. I guess we all know what customer support is, and um, hopefully we you're lucky if you don't have uh, much, uh, if you don't need to contact customer support most of the time, I guess we don't really want to have uh, a lot of things to do with them because sometimes it can be really hard. Uh, it's mm -hmm. really, I meet people anymore at customer support. It's most of the time it's bots and so on, but just to say that today we are talking about customer success and that's something that can be quite new for, for a lot of people. So how would you describe what is a customer success? So uh, customer success is the proactive uh, training enablement um, and uh, guidance of our most valuable merchants, our most valuable clients. So, you know, how is that different? Um, you know, customer support is reactive. Uh, customer success, merchant success is proactive. That means I am going to work almost as an external team member for that yeah. merchant, for that client. I'm going to be making sure that they're utilizing whatever technology uh, it is um, the best way possible to get the greatest return on their investment um, and to ensure that uh, they are, are continuing to grow um, and potentially even you know, looking at other areas of, of business. How are they acquiring customers? Um, how are they themselves doing customer support um, and being really that kind of trusted advisor. Um, so there's a, a pretty big difference there in what customer success, merchant success, client success, however we want to call it, um, versus customer support. Yeah, and basically, would you say that customer success is a, like a global philosophy of one company or is it just an expertise of, of some people of, let's say, customer success managers, they are, you know, uh, they should be keeping it on or is it just a, would you call it a, a, a philosophy for, for the whole company? <clears throat> um, I would say uh, my philosophy is that, that uh, you know, merchant success, customer success uh, really should be embodied throughout a whole organization. Um, uh, that is all the way from sales to partnerships um, through to actually, you know, our customer success team. So um, what does that mean from the sales side? It means that we are selling in a way that facilitates solving challenges that a particular client or merchant may have. Um, uh, we are not selling just to sell, we are selling to solve a problem. Um, yeah. And that, you know, that really goes through with partnerships as well. When we look at who we partner with or the partners, uh, supporting the merchants or the partners selling the same way? Are they selling uh, around solving a problem or a challenge for a merchant? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if merchants are finding success, uh, they, they stay with you. I mean, it, it, we don't sell uh, merchants on short-term solutions. We try to look to, you know, how can we solve their problems now and how can we have them grow with us and honestly help us grow as a company um, through product feedback, through, um, you know, uh, continuous uh, loops back to our customer success teams that we can use to better enable uh, future merchants as well as them. So basically what you said is that it's uh, instead of selling your product, you sell a solution for their problem. That's 100%. one of the key points, I guess. Right. Yes. And uh, maybe let's talk about your experience at Shopify, Shopify Plus so we can better understand how you, did you implement the customer success philosophy and, uh, and uh, partnership strategy. So could you shortly tell us uh, what exactly were you doing uh, at Shopify Plus? What were your challenges? Yeah, so in the beginning, really a little bit of everything. I mean, Shopify Plus started with myself and, and one salesperson um, and one uh, customer success manager um, and really started as an experiment. Um, so, you know, really throughout the years, it was a little bit of everything. It was helping, uh, you know, make sure that we were forming the right uh, merchant success management team. Um, we later split that into um, an onboarding team and then a merchant success team so that there was kind of a different skill set there. Um, solution engineering so that we were always selling in a way that solved the merchant's challenges rather than just selling uh, a dream or a piece of software. Yeah. Um, 
it's, it's how are we actually going to discover uh, what the merchant's challenges are, <clears throat> look at our product, align the product to the solution, um, and, and make sure that uh, we weren't gonna have um, challenges that we couldn't help that merchant with um, six months down the road, a year down the road, two years down the road. Yes. Um, so really a little bit of, of, of everything in that regard, um, um, including um, partnerships um, in the early days. Um, it, we have merchants coming in, um, you know, typically SaaS products like uh, Shopify, like um, Omnisim. <clears throat> we're not service companies. We're we're a product company. So um, we rely on partners to service those those uh, merchants and to um, help them either build their site, um, sometimes manage their marketing, um, and so building a network of like-minded um, partners, whether that's agency or technology partners, um, is super vital in, in ensuring that that merchant success as well. Yeah. Now, could you give us an example of how? Do these partnerships happen? Because it's, I think it's hard for us to imagine, like how many partnerships you have a, a year. Uh, how often do they happen? Uh, what are you looking when Lucas? you are find? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear ah, you. Here we go. I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll just uh, uh, repeat my question. So uh, talking about partnerships, could you give us a us an example of a partnership that you did at Shopify Plus that worked worked out really great? Because it's, I think it's kind of hard for us to imagine like how many partnerships you had a year. Uh, was it like 200, 2,000, 100 or something like that? And what were the requ requirements that you were looking for in the partners? How did that work out? That's a really good question. And um, it's highly variable. So, and, it, and it can change over time too. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a really good example. Um, like. When, when you're first bringing on a, a, a merchant, um, there's there's kind of two categories, things that are nice to have and things that you must have in order yeah. to operate a business. <laughs> so um, really the first area that, that we attacked um, from a problem solving perspective with partnerships at Shopify um, were uh, e like connections to ERPs um, so uh, or order management systems. So things, um, things like uh, in-channel, Omni, um, things like uh, MuleSoft. I'm just trying to find some general examples that where um, you've got a kind of a multi uh, API bus connector that connects your, your various platforms to each other. Um, and you know, if I am a, a large retailer and I'm using you know, Oracle ERP or Microsoft Dynamics 365 or NetSuite, yeah. Uh, it is absolutely vital to my business that my data is flowing between my e-commerce presence and my ERP system. So, um, you know, that was one that, um, you know, very early on was very important to make sure that we were solving that problem, that we had good, strong partners who were also kind of success oriented around uh, merchant needs um, and could fill those needs. Um, another, I think, good example is, and this is, of another categorization is what is it something that every merchant needs. Um, so in the case of Shopify, taxes are kind of top of mind. Um, whether you're selling just in North America or whether you're selling globally, um, you've got to collect tax depending on where you're at. Um, you may have to remit tax um, and report. Um, so partnership with Avalara was super helpful um, and made it, things very easy for merchants so that you can take something uh, that's very complex um, yeah. and uh, not try to overextend what your specialization is as a platform and lean on a partner to bring that specialization. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can imagine a lot of people are, are, are listening to you and thinking about their own businesses and how they can partnership better. Could you give us some advice? It's like, uh, how, how did you work on that? Like, do you have, uh, just, that's a very bold question, but I just want to imagine how does it work? Do you have a list of partners that you want to work with and you go from the first one to the to the, to the second one and to the third, or do you approach with an exact uh, suggestion? What do you want to do? Or you just go get a coffee and uh, discuss how does it work out? So how do you approach a, a partner? Yeah, so I think you always start with the, the challenge that your your clients are having. Um, uh, at that point, then you you do go into kind of a vetting process. Um, you know. Uh, 
And in some cases, it's going to be, you know, only a few options that need to be vetted and discussed. Um, you've got to involve your product team to make sure that uh, the APIs are supported across um, the partner network. You got to make sure that there is uh, buy-in from both uh, sides, um, from an engineering and product perspective, as well as a marketing and go-to-market perspective. So um, there's a whole lot that, that goes into that. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's more challenging, depending on how complex uh, the challenges that you're trying to solve for a merchant. So highly variable. Um, I would say at a high level, you need to make sure, you know, first of all, um, you know, do, do, does the partner have a good solution? Is it already uh, being widely used um, mm -hmm. to solve similar challenges. Um, and number two, do they approach customer success, merchant success, uh, the same way that, that you do? Um, at the end of the day, a partnership is is only as good as the, the level with which they support your, your shared clients. Um, they can have the best solution in the world, but if nobody answers tickets, if nobody answers telephones, um, and you know, is there for uh, a, you know reliability um, from a question perspective, then it, the solution doesn't mean anything. Um, it, it could be the best solution in the world, but if that doesn't um, happen on the customer success side, then it's not going to end well. Yeah, and you mentioned that uh, the product must be uh, already widely used. So does it mean that you look for you know big names, big players first uh, to, to join, to have in part? How, how important is that to have big names uh, in your partners does it, does it matter at all i don't think that's i don't think that's necessarily and, and i didn't mean to imply that um widely used could just simply mean like market proven um yeah but for your brand image does it does it does it do anything that you have you know big names as your partners or you don't really it, care about that in some situations it does um yeah. I mean, there, and there's certainly something to be said um from an addressable market perspective. I mean, one of the facets of partnership is to expand your market reach. Um, if you're a partnering with somebody who has, uh, you know, 50, you know, merchants, um, that can be very different than somebody who has, you know, 5,000 merchants using uh, their product, depending on what space you're in. Yeah. If you are in very enterprise space, there are plenty of su very large successful businesses that only have 50 clients worldwide uh, that, that have, you know, massive revenue so it really just depends on the area of market and you're in um but um <clears throat> i think that's another thing to consider too is you know what is the the actual crossover um from uh the addressable market perspective so do they service the same size clients that are technology services mm -hmm. um or do they service you know merchants that are too small do they service merchants that are, that are too large um, and making sure that there's kind of a sweet spot there um, with uh, the way you look at that and the way that you plan a go-to-market strategy with that partner. Yeah, and uh, are there any metrics that you can you know, really account for when you're wait, waiting the, the, the possible partners? How would you, are there any numbers that you look at? Uh, what, what are the important ones, ones would you say? So I think it depends on whether you're looking at like a service-based partner, like an agency, or whether you're looking at like a, another technology partner um, in the SaaS space. Um, uh, I would say that the again the metrics you want to look at, um, you know, do they operate within the same ecosystems that you're operating and or looking to operate in in the future? Um, again, you know, market fit size, you know they could have it's 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 so highly variable lucas so yeah uh, you could have somebody who in a specific space who um maybe only services a thousand uh, merchants um, but their goals align more closely with you than somebody who uh has five thousand uh you know uh e-commerce merchants whose goals don't align with with your strategy um so it, again variability there if you're looking for just TAM, you're not looking at the whole picture. Um, yeah. You have to make sure that the goals are aligned. Yeah, and I asked uh, this question before, but uh, how many partnerships you had at Shopify Plus? Like, how often did that happen? Um, so one one thing we really tried to take into account there, and, and I, we will at, at Omnison as well, is um, pa paralyzation um, by 
having too many choices is a real thing. Um, yeah. If you, if you go into a merchant and hand them like 10 solutions for something, uh, you're, you're being lazy. Um, you should vet the partners better. You should make sure that there's better alignment, um, better go to market strategies. Um, so the philosophy there was we really tried to focus in on the leading like three to four solutions within any given space, whether it was order mm -hmm. management, whether it was ERP connectors, whether it was, uh, you know, Mar MarTech or uh, UGC, it was, you know, how do we make sure that we've got uh, the right partners that service the different types of merchants that we use. So, you know, there are some partners that operate a little more down market. Um, there's some that operate a little more up market. Um, but, you know, how do we get the best in class um, and not overwhelm um, and do a lot of the vetting and make sure that we're keeping strong alignment. Um, and if we're not, then we find a new partner and, and move an old partner out. Yeah. And just as you mentioned, it's really hard to, to know in advance what is going to work and it's uh, all different situations and so on. But do you often trust your guts when you, when you choose the partner? Uh, can you, you know, have a feeling or, of, of how it's going to work out? Uh, how to make partnerships that are really great? Uh, how, how do these I mean, kind of partnerships really start, to start with? How do they yeah. start? There's always a human component, right? Um, yeah. Like they, again, same thing. They could be have the best solution in the world, um, but if there isn't a culture fit, um, if there isn't a good connection uh, with the you know between teams, then it's not going to be a successful partnership. So, in a lot of ways, yeah, you you still have to rely on your your, uh, your you know the metrics that are available to you, um, but also gut instinct always goes a very long way. Um, and the longer you are in a specific industry, um, the, the better those those uh, kind of uh, Spider-Man senses uh, <laughs> into work. <laughs> yeah, it sounds. Uh, talking to you, it sounds you have to have some instincts and have some have the the nose yeah. for it, as we say. And uh, we have a question from one of the viewers, which is, uh, and that's very nice to, uh, to have. So I don't want to make him wait. Ignis is asking, is it true that the majority of revenue from your relationship with a customer happens post sale, after the sales? Uh, I would say absolutely like the, the LTV, the lifetime value of yeah. a merchant. And that's why we have, you know, a proactive uh, client success modeling, right? Um, you know, it costs more even for a merchant. It's the same for a merchant. It costs more to acquire that, whether it's through PPC or, you know, uh, you know, influencer marketing um, than it does to retain that, that uh, consumer or in our case of SaaS uh, uh, client um, longer term. So, um, you know, ideally we want to keep our clients happy forever. Um, but realistically, um, you know, you at least want to, in a SaaS business, um, have, uh, an understanding that, uh, you know, you're going to keep that client for three to five years, um, minimum, um, make sure that you're constantly improving and evolving the product to meet their needs, um, and make sure that you have the right support mechanisms in place, um, to, so to, uh, make sure that they're continuously growing and continuously using more areas of your product as well. And uh, coming back to customer success, I already asked you about partnership strategy, uh, partnership KPIs. What about customer success KPIs? How do you follow how happy are your customers? Um, how much analytics do you have? How much analysis do you do? Um, a, a good bit. So we, we obviously track uh, net promoter scores, um, number one. Um, we also like to measure engagement. Um, you know, are they responding? Are they showing up to uh, meetings that are scheduled? Um, yeah. Uh, and the other piece I think that's really important to have a, a deep understanding of is, are they making money using your platform at the very baseline? Uh, what is the return on their investment? If they're paying you, uh, you know, 500 a month, are they mm -hmm. making, you know, five, 10, $15,000 a month? Um, and having a deep understanding of what that that uh, net ROI is kind of across uh, different uh, verticals of merchants and making sure that they're not uh, outside of, of uh, some parameters there so that you can have some early warning signals. Uh, and again, just strengthen that proactive uh, approach. Um, and it could be, you know, with, uh, you know, somebody's not getting the ROI, maybe they're not using the product 
correctly. Maybe they're not using it fully. Maybe there's only one area that they're using and they could use some help with a strategy of how to you know, use more facets of your product. In the case of OmniSend, for instance, you know, we're Omni, omni-channel marketing. Uh, maybe they're just using email, but we should you know, be coaching them on how to effectively use uh, push notifications or, or Facebook Messenger notifications or uh, SMS. Um, and how do we get them using more areas of the product that we're providing for them to ensure that they're getting the ROI out of the product? And uh, it's funny that, that you mentioned en- engagement because I, I believe it's quite common. And I wonder how it's in your experience that partners or customers uh, don't really get engaged with you. So it's, does, it, does it happen that it's hard to help them because there is no much, not much engagement? And how to change that? How to get uh, the, the other party involved? Do you have any secrets for that? So I think engagement starts at the sales process, right? Um, the the challenge with SaaS is a lot of times we don't get that sales process because in the SaaS world, um, in most cases, a, a client can go straight to the site, put in their credit card and start using the product. Um, so um, on the sales side, I feel like it's a little bit easier if they come into the sales funnel, you have engagement from the beginning, you are working with them to you know, solve their challenges, work through the uh, many uh, problems they're trying to overcome with their current uh, you know, situation. Um, on the self-serve model, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, uh, and some people just simply don't want to be engaged um, at the end of the day. Uh, you know, they may want to stick to email support. They may never want to get on a phone call. Um, so you have to kind of be able to try to service them the way that they're most comfortable with. Um, and you're going to have different personas within your, your uh, portfolio. And some of them, uh, no matter what you try to do, are never going to get on a phone call with you. And you just have to be okay with that uh, and still try to be proactive at the same time. Okay, and um, a lot of off topic uh, for anyone who is uh, thinking that I'm just chatting with someone uh, uh, beside this chat. I'm just writing down some of the insights that I'm hearing from Jamie, and I'll try to share uh, these at the end of our talk that I, I, I try to catch, but uh, I, I really heard something which is um, very useful for me. So I'm picking these up. I, I'll try to name this at the end of our talk. Uh, and Jamie, could you share us anything that didn't work out? Did you make any mistakes while at Shopify Plus that we could uh, uh, we could learn from? Any missed opportunities or anything that you would do different regarding customer success and partnerships? Um, on customer success, um, no, I think we, we scaled that pretty well. The challenge of all customer success is a, a, it's probably getting those personas right. Um, uh, because there's only so many, um, clients that a single human being can interact with yeah. uh, within a week or within a month or within a day. Um, so the challenge with really good customer success, um, client success, merchant success, um, is that linear scale. Um, the more clients you bring on, the more account managers you need to hire, um, the yeah. more <laughs> managers you hire, the more you need to measure the results and manage them and train them. So you end up with this kind of uh, massive organization um, just due to scaling issues. Um, So I think one thing we could have probably done earlier would be to get the personas down. Um, But, um, you know, when you're growing as quickly and and, and that thing, that's one thing that we're trying to do uh, really early on at Omnison is get the personas down. understand who wants a high level of engagement, who wants a low level of engagement, who is self-sufficient um, and is never going to want client success. You've got some you know, that come in uh, that are highly technical or they're pro marketers and they may never put in a ticket uh, until they're you know, at simply actively having a problem. They may ne- never get on a phone call unless they're trying to um, solve a roadblock the platform. So I think that would be one that we're trying to attack really early on. On the partnership side, um, I mean, yes, I mean, nobody's perfect here, right? And and the program that you put in place is gonna be perfect, but I think you have to be willing to uh, make those mistakes, make those experiments, and um, be ready to pivot. Um, You're not gonna 
ever get it right the first time across any part of your organization. So <laughs> um, making sure that everyone on your teams um, knows that it's absolutely okay to, to fail um, and to recognize it quickly um, and to learn from it and to pivot based on uh, what you learned. I mean, th these are always learning um, examples. So, you know, as we're looking to build out the partner program on Omnisend, um, you know, we're realizing really quickly kind of who's a good fit on the, the uh, service partner side and who we need to work with really closely uh, on the technology side. Um, and we're going to have challenges and we're going to have to pivot along the way. Um, and every time you do that, you're going to learn. Okay, that's that's encouraging, kind of to, to make sure that everyone in your team is, uh, can fail sometimes. Uh, I guess that's some kind of thing that we are still missing in Lithuania. Is that an American thing to do to say, okay, that it's okay to fail? Uh, I would say we are far from this philosophy here in, in Europe and especially in Lithuania. It's, we are kind of um, best to judge people. So. Do you see that, uh, or, or does it work out naturally for you? Uh, do you have so, to embrace that? I think you have to embrace that. That's always been the way that I've led teams. Um, otherwise, you end up um, not getting some of the best ideas bubbling up to the surface, or people are afraid to raise their hand and make the suggestion, and that's not uh, healthy for the team. Uh, it's also not healthy for innovation within a company as well. Yeah. So. Um, if people are afraid to uh, experiment because it's not going to end well, you're going to end up with no experiments. And it's mm -hmm. how we uh, find new pathways to success. So uh, I think everybody has to, uh, within a team, uh, embrace uh, failure, um, you know, be okay with shining a spotlight on your own failure, um, sharing that vulnerability and learning from it. And the entire team can learn from that as well. Um, okay. so, yeah, I think it's it has to be part of the company culture um, very early on, um, and I think it has to be embraced. Yeah, I, I guess a lot of us now just have checked if we have this in our companies, uh, in our field of, of, of working. Uh, we have one more question, which is super nice. And Carolina, sorry for for uh, keep you waiting. Uh, Carolina is asking, ideally, how often should you proactively approach your customers? Um, I, I guess the answer is as often as you can. As or, often as you can and as often as they want. <laughs> um, and I think, um, again, it, this really boils down to the personas. Um, you know, if, if somebody is, um, you know, uh, has a, a, a large team, highly technical, um, they may look at it as a distraction or an annoyance um, from being, you know, reached out to uh, too, too terribly often. Um, uh, so I think you, you have to do a persona, um, understand, take really good notes so that as, you know, accounts get moved around, um, that you have uh, a really deep understanding of who wants what and, and why, um, so that you're not overreaching as well. Okay. Uh, we have one more question from a startup. Uh, it was sent to me personally, but they want to share it with you. Um, is it possible and worthwhile approach to approach a strategic partner in a pre-seed stage uh, and without a finished minimal viable product? So is it is it worthwhile approaching partners when you have in the very early stages of your startup? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the difference is, um, you know, size matters. So what you have to bring as a pre-seed uh, early stage startup uh, to the table, really, you need to really show the value of how it solves problems for your, you know, hopeful new partners, uh, merchant base. Um, if you've got a, a product uh, that is outside of the scope of something they're going to solve, um, and it does a really good job of removing a barrier for them, either on the sales side um, or on the customer success side, or increases ROI for their merchants, I think it's absolutely vital early on to get some of those. Uh, early partnerships in place. Um, the the challenge will be from a you know a smaller startup will be maybe some of the GTM planning, the go to market planning um, resources may be a challenge. Like you know from a marketing perspective, typically pre seed you're not going to have a large marketing team. They may want to yeah. build content or do 
uh, things that are, you know, outside of the scope of what you can can uh, perform. But if you've got the right solution, that may be where you can lean on their strengths um, from a marketing perspective. Um, and they can lean on your strengths um, from maybe a product perspective, or maybe you're more open to uh, building a, you know, wrapping uh, your product development cycles around their specific feedback and their needs um, for their merchants. So I think there's a lot of ways to open those doors. Okay, and I, I have a follow-up of this questions of this question uh, from the same startup. They are asking: Is it a common practice to ask for a non-disclosure agreement between partners, and is it okay to ask for it during the first meeting? So I can imagine I can imagine it's the same startup that doesn't have a product yet, and it has to meet the partners, <laughs> and they don't have nothing to show, but they also want to to, to have a non-disclosure agreement, and maybe that's something that is uncomfortable to ask, but is gotcha. that a normal practice? Um, yes and no. Um, like at the end of the day, uh, d depending on, you know, who you're approaching with the, the MNDA, it always helps if they're coming to you. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little different if you're knocking yeah. on their door with a piece of legal paper going, hey, please sign, sign my uh, MNDA so I can speak to you. <laughs> but my solution is probably... That doesn't happen often in, when you're a little startup. So. Um, probably not. Um, so that, that one's probably going to be, um, here's what I would do. I would try to forge a, a, re a relationship um, with, uh, you know, a few people uh, within that organization, maybe around the product side um, uh, bef before you get too far down the path. But um, if you're approaching somebody, and you don't have demonstrable software, then you're approaching them too early. So if it's just in the idea stage, you don't have shared merchants, um, I would probably say that's not a good fit. Um, as soon as you've got shared merchants, then it becomes a viable conversation. Um, and the more meaningful the shared uh, client, the more meaningful uh, the conversation, and then you've got a leg to stand on when you're asking for uh, an MNDA. Yeah, and I think we'll want to talk about Omniscient also just in a few minutes, but just to you know, round it up and to have some checklists for, for all the listeners who are here with us, uh, what would be the questions to ask yourself about your company that would make you check if customer success is happening in your company or not? What can I ask myself? Could you, could you share with us? Um, so do I know my client sentiment? Am I getting NPS scores at the very baseline? Um, if you're not getting NPS scores uh, mm -hmm. programmatically uh, after every interaction or after uh, they install your software, or uh, you, you've got to get that insight first and foremost. Um, without that, you're flying blind. Um, so uh, NPS score is probably the most important thing to be getting at as many touch points as possible. Um, that's the biggest metric that's going to allow you to start to dive in. Um, if I don't know somebody is giving me an uh, NPS of three. I don't know to reach out to them to find out why. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is all wrapped around client satisfaction um, and mm -hmm. growth. Um, and that's going to be the easiest early warning signal you can get. Um, outside of, outside of that, um, <clears throat> having some understanding of, uh, in pattern matching um, within your ticketing system. If you've got a customer success ticketing system, whether it's intercom or, or uh, you know, some other solution um, is pattern matching. Are people writing in tickets, all, you know, and is our 10% of them over a specific issue? Um, that's a, a clear warning sign that you need to get on, on top of that and make sure that uh, that issue goes away. So um, I would say, encouraging that feedback as often as possible and it's make it as easy as possible. Yeah. So, so would you say that the, the net promoter score is about uh, asking uh, would this customer recommend me to, to someone else, right? That would be the question. Baseline. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I want to talk about Omniscient uh, just in a minute, but to round up Shopify Plus, uh, could you tell us how much you grew uh, when you worked there? Uh, what was the percentage or, or how many people uh, joined in? Um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think made Shopify Plus um, 
stand out from comp competitors because both Shopify and you grew really a lot in, in uh -huh. the past few years. <clears throat> a lot of work, um, a lot of uh, marketing, um, and um, honestly, a lot of being at the right place at the right time as well. Um, there, How to make that happen? <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's very hard to make that happen. Um, but I think you have to be able to recognize those opportunities when they do happen and fully leverage and take advantage of them. So, um, you know, at the time, um, you know, early days, like Magento was having problems um, with uh, moving uh, to to V two, and they were giving mixed messages, and it was very uh easy to message to those merchants who were maybe confused maybe feeling uncertain um and that really did help uh with with growth um early on um working with partners um helped that growth a lot as well um extending the agency network helped with that growth uh as well if you've got agency advocates and merchants are going to development agencies and development agencies are recommending um, your solution, um, then, you know, nine times out of 10, the merchant is going to go with what the agency of record um, is recommending. So um, kind of a multi-pronged attack. I know this isn't like a magic uh, answer um, because it was all a lot of things that, that facilitated that growth and a whole lot of work from a, a lot of different teams that, that facilitated that growth. Um, you know, the sales team grew massively. The solutions engineering team grew massively in order to help um, you know, again, sell on a solution um, to a problem or make sure that the, the uh, platform was going to suit the needs of a particular merchant. Uh, the partnership group team grew massively um, across both agency and technology. Um, and I think it was a concerted effort um, that really made a lot of that happen. But some of the early wins were really simply about um, selling in a really good way that facilitated, um, you know, centering around merchant needs and requirements. Um, anybody who's running a sales team, if you always make sure that you actually uh, are digging into what the merchant's problems are and being open to um, you know, finding a, that solution and also be open to saying no, if you cannot build a solution yeah. uh, is gonna be the key to long-term growth. Um, Got a lot of situations where you know, Shopify wasn't the right solution, um, but going through that process with that merchant um, and letting them know that we actually cared about making sure that they're they're uh, they were coming to a good solution um, netted us more business because they would come back with you know other opportunities later and respected that sales process of being open uh, and honest uh, and not trying to pull a fast win. Uh, on them and just get them sold um, and move on to another opportunity. So I think um, making sure that your merch again merchant centric across the entire organization um, will help facilitate that growth. Uh, you may not be the right fit now, uh, but people change jobs, people move as e-commerce managers somewhere else. They will remember that, and you will be a fit at some point. Yeah, it sounded to me like yeah, what you're saying is uh, that you must understand not only your strengths, but also your weaknesses and not to try to oversell yourself if you can't really give the, the value to your partners. Yeah. And Absolutely. yeah, we, we still have some, times for, some time for questions. Is, if anyone has any, uh, it, it was really lovely to receive some questions from, from the viewers. Uh, and at the moment, you're working at Omnison and that's, you know, a uh, multi-channel e-commerce e uh, uh, platform or another platform, how would you, uh, how would you call it? Oh, marketing, uh, automation, marketing automation tool would be more correct, I guess. So what? yeah, how, how different are your challenges now? Um, uh, they're, they're pretty similar, right? Yeah. We have a really good product. Um, uh, we need to uh, scale partnerships. We need to scale sales. We need to scale uh, client success. Um, the challenges are similar. I, think, I mean, these are challenges that all, all organizations are going to have when they reach a certain size. Um, um, you know, we've got a really good product, um, but making sure that we're getting the right product feedback um, from the right merchants so that we can, you know, uh, flywheel that back into uh, the way that we shape 
effective platform over time. Um, the bringing in the right partners so that we can um, maybe focus our efforts on uh, our core competencies and let you know the right partners step in, whether it's for you know, review systems or uh, loyalty, um, and and make sure that we work very seamlessly with the solutions that uh, merchants want to use. Um, and then you know really, yeah, there's 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 a whole lot of alignment from early days of. Uh, Shopify to uh, where we're at with with Omnisim. Um so it's really exciting um, and it's a great okay. company. Uh, love the the co-founders, so it helps also to have um, that that culture that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, we've got founders who are not afraid to go after it. Um, founders who are not afraid to um, run, you know do experiments um, and you know fail quickly. Um, and succeed and double down where where we do experiment and things work really well. Yeah, and, uh, talking to you, I feel like I do two little partnerships, and I would call these. Uh, uh, it's just as in the personal level, you have to delegate instead of doing everything yourself. I guess in the company level, you have to partnership to, to grow. Uh, do you do do you have any safeguards before starting a partnership? How do you how safe you want to be before starting it because it's just something an uncomfortable thing to do to start a partnership because you have to trust the other other party do you have any safeguards that you put into into your connection into your partnership that or is it Not more really. of a, in, in a human level i think yeah it's it's really about the, the level of communication and it's also um you know start small uh, i always you know the analogy is the the crawl walk run scenario um so even when we approach a partnership you know at the very minimum we need to have shared merchants um or a shared integration um and then how do we slowly kind of increase the level of engagement between uh the two organizations um measure uh success often um and if things are going well you double down um if things are not going well then you adjust um try some new things um, and if they still aren't working, then it's probably not the best partnership. Um, mm -hmm. So it's pretty pretty cut and dry. But I think the really the safeguard is, you know, you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Number one, you're not going to have just one partner in one space. So you know, uh, you know, typically it's not a good experience to have too many partners. It's also not a good experience to not have enough partners. Yeah. Um, if you only have one partner um, for a specific function, let's say loyalty uh, and or reviews, um, then you're not giving merchants choice and merchants want a little choice. They just don't want the whole universe of choice. Um, so, but I think starting off small um, and then iterating is really the best safeguard you've got when it comes to partnerships. Yeah. And, and you mentioned before that you usually have three or four leading partners that you work in. So that's, that's kind of a number that you used to work for you in, in the Shopify plus, right? That's, yeah. That was your sweet number. And uh, we are coming to, to an end of our fire, fireside talk. I still have my insights that I want to share with you. Okay, maybe I'll do that. I, I'll just share what I had um, a second to write to myself, uh, what are my takeaways from this talk, and uh, sure. maybe just to share with everyone who are listening, maybe miss something, maybe they have, of course, they have different um, insights that they take away with them. For me, um, Oh, so many grammar mistakes because I was so uh, such in a hurry to write down. But um, first of all, that you mentioned was it's very important to distinguish between nice to have and must have. That's so basic, but that's so, so true. So I'm taking this away with me. Um, start with the challenge that your customers have. Sell solution, not the product. Again, such a, you know, in a way, a fundamental thing to, to do and, and say, but... Um, I would agree that's very important. Uh, too many choices paralyze. Uh, that was a great one. I guess we can use this one uh, in, in our uh, business life uh, just as in personal life. Uh, it was nice to hear that you had three or four leading partners to hear a number that is, you know, now when someone does partnership, I think they can kind of check check if, if they are doing 12 or 15 or 30, maybe that's that's too much. Maybe that's not working for them. Uh, and PR score, it was interesting to hear that you are leaning on it to, to, to count your uh, count the sentiments of, of your customers that uh, I kind of did, did not expect that, but that's also understandable. So that's, that, these are my takeaways 
just some of the takeaways that I managed to write down. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. Thank you for all who are watching us. There were at least 20 people most of the time watching us. There will be more uh, during uh, the next few days when this video is online. And for anyone who is interested in more um, talks like this, you should follow Startup Fair Facebook page for more, for more information about upcoming sessions, which are happening offline because of the coronavirus. But as, as I can see, it's going quite well. So thanks again, Jamie. Uh, it was Jamie Sutton from Omnisand, uh, formal uh, Shopify Plus uh, head of technology. Thank you, Jamie, very much. Thank you. All the best wishes to USA, to, 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 to your home. And uh, thank you again. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.